I've been driving and working on cars for close to 15 years now. And I've discovered it really doesn't take much to keep them happy. Why, even when I've been out with them on a date, I never felt the need to thank them in the morning. And I never sent them flowers or candy or even remembered their birthday. But if you want your car to be there for you in the morning, you know, those cold mornings or climbing steep hills or getting you home on those creepy deserted back streets late at night, well, you've got to invest a little time in your car. Not much, maybe 15 minutes a month. Give your car a well-balanced diet, it'll drive you anywhere. Cars like that gassed feeling, provided it's the right octane. They like to be full, full of oil, full of water, full of fresh air. Hi, I'm Rich Hall. Now we're all old enough to drive so we can talk, right? Cars need a physical relationship. And Deanna Sklar, the author of the book, Auto Repair for Dummies, and I are here to help you get over your old fears and old taboos. We want to encourage you to touch your car's parts. In fact, after watching this tape, you should feel guilty and unfulfilled if you don't. I've been writing about cars and working on them for many years. I started as a total dummy, but I found that maintaining my car was easy once I knew what to do. Today, the world has changed. For one thing, we've gone from full-service to self-service gas stations. That means we all have to become more responsible for our car's health. We don't really have to become do-it-yourself mechanics, but we have to learn to maintain our cars ourselves or face costly repairs. Now, this tape is for people who know nothing about cars, people who usually think they can't do it themselves. This is a basic preventive maintenance tape. It's not how to rebuild your transmission or how to pack your front wheel bearing. We're going to show you what your car needs. And if you follow a few simple procedures, you'll probably save money, help your car live longer, save fuel, cut air pollution, and avoid being intimidated by mechanics. We recommend a few things before we begin. Always use the correct tools. You won't need a lot of them, and we'll let you know which ones to use before each section. If you're not sure where the dipstick or the carburetor is on your car, then Check your owner's manual, or buy the service manual for the year, make, and model of your car. On a personal note, I never recommend touching the brakes or the air conditioning. Since those are potentially dangerous, if I have problems, I usually go to an expert. So, let's see if we can make you a little bit more of an expert. Now, by spending just 15 minutes a month on your car, checking it out, and by learning to spot problems before they occur, you can probably save 70% of all highway breakdowns. 
Most of us don't relish the idea of getting our hands all gooked up with oil and grease. You'll be happy to know that there are products on the market you can rub on your hands, and the dirt and the grease will just wash right off. Car grease is as easy to remove as garden dirt, so don't worry. Car maintenance won't permanently soil your hands or your image. Now, not to get too basic, but the first thing we want to learn is how to unlatch the hood. If you don't know how, either check your owner's manual or get some gas from the full service island at your local gas station. Then get out and watch the attendant. It's a great way to find out where your oil dipstick is, too. Now, most current model cars have a double latch system. The hood release is right under the dash. You just pull it. Then you walk back up to the front of the car, and you look for the little handle that's right up under the hood. And you pull on it, squeeze it, whatever. Pull up this concussion stick. Called the concussion stick because if you don't put it up, this will fall down and give you a concussion. <laughs> now, we're going to get a better look at the engine by removing the hoods through the magic of video. Ready? Don't try this at home, kids. The first thing to check is the air filter. Open the wing nut. Some have clamps. And remove the top of the air cleaner. Lift the filter and look through it at a bright light. The sun will do. If it's dirty, drop it gently to jar the dirt loose. If it's still blocked, replace it. Cars run on air rather than just on gasoline. So cars with dirty filters can get asthmatic. They use more fuel and they perform poorly. You'll probably need to change your air filter every six months. More often if you drive in dusty areas. Check the oil. You'll get a lot more accurate reading now than at a gas station because the oil won't be splashed around the inside of the engine from driving. Also, be sure you're on level ground. To check the oil, remove the oil dipstick and wipe it with a clean, lint-free rag. Push it all the way back in and remove again. Feel the oil with your fingers. Don't worry if it's black, but if it leaves dirty streaks or feels gritty, it should be changed. Read the end of the dipstick. Is it safely between the add and full line? Now, if it's below the add line, unscrew the oil filler cap and add oil until it's safely between the add and the full lines. Remember, never overfill your car with oil. That's as bad as not having enough oil. We'll tell you a lot more about oil later on. Check the fluid in the cooling system. Most later model cars have a plastic overflow bottle for coolant. You can see right through it to check the level of the liquid inside. Add coolant until the level in the overflow tank reads between min and max. Now, if your car doesn't have an overflow bottle, use a safety radiator cap. It has a pressure release handle on it, just like this. Only open the radiator cap if the car engine is cool. Hot radiator fluid can burn you. First, lift the handle to release the pressure. Then, use a rag and open the cap away from your face. Just be careful. Now, make sure that the fluid covers the fins inside the radiator. Most cars should have the radiator flushed once a year because the rust inhibitors in the coolant wear out. You can check to see if the temperature controlling qualities of the coolant still work with one of these little goodies. This is a coolant tester. It looks kind of like a little bulb baster. It only costs a couple of dollars, and you can get one at your local car parts dealer, or even in the supermarket. Draw some coolant into the tester. The floating balls will show you whether the coolant needs to be changed. By the way, there's no difference between coolant and antifreeze. Check the hoses. Are they brittle, squishy, cracked, or leaking? If any of them look bad, have your mechanic change them. If you're up to doing this yourself, then get Deanna's book, Auto Repair for Dummies. Go to the car parts store, tell them the model, the make, and the year of your car, and they'll get the right hose for you. In any case, take care of it before they break and leave you stranded on the highway. We recommend that you locate, but never fool with air conditioning hoses. These hoses are full of Freon under pressure, and that can be dangerous. They usually have hose clamps that look like this, instead of regular hose clamps, so you can tell which ones they are. Now, as long as you're in there feeling around, why not check out the electrical wires? See if they're old, brittle, or frayed. And if they are, 
replace them. Did you know that faulty spark plug cables can actually cost you gallons of gas? Check the fan belts. Wiggle each one. You should have about half an inch of play. Turn them over to see if they're worn or frayed. Fan belts cost very little. Getting towed because a belt broke costs much more. Check the battery. Open the caps on the top, unless, of course, it's a sealed battery. Liquid should cover the little metal fins inside. If not, add some water. Distilled water is best since it's the cleanest, but almost any water will do in an emergency. Now, there are little testers for batteries, just like the ones for coolant. Draw up some of the battery fluid, and you can tell if it's getting to be time to replace your battery. Replace the caps, then brush off any deposits around the terminals with an old toothbrush. You can mix a tablespoonful of baking soda with a cup of water and splash them on the terminals to remove those powdery deposits. Sure, they're pretty, but they corrode battery cables. When you're done, coat the terminals with grease or petroleum jelly to prevent future corrosion. Now, if you get some battery fluid on your hands or your clothes, remember that it's caustic. So you want to rinse it off with water right away. And it's probably not a good idea to use that toothbrush on your teeth again unless you want to end up looking like... If you drive a car with an automatic transmission, you should check the transmission fluid. This is the one procedure that requires you to start your engine. Be sure to put the car in park or neutral and use the emergency brake. This is important. Get long hair, neckties, dangling jewelry, and loose clothes out of the way. The dipstick is usually against the firewall on the passenger side. Use the same procedure as for checking oil. The fluid should be pink, not brown. If it smells burnt, have your transmission checked. If the level is down, add fluid down the same hole the dipstick came out of. It doesn't take much, so be careful not to overfill it. Check your car owner's manual for the type of transmission fluid you should use. You know, low transmission fluid causes the same symptoms as a faulty transmission. Knowing this can save you hundreds of dollars in unneeded repairs. After you've checked the transmission fluid, turn off your engine. Be sure to check the brake fluid. On the driver's side of the car, near the firewall, there's a little box or a small plastic bottle. This is the master cylinder for the car's brake system. If your car has a plastic bottle, you'll be able to see whether the brake fluid comes up to the full or the maximum line. In any case, if the fluid level is low, more should be added. Don't use old brake fluid or expose it to air for very long because it attracts moisture which can cause corrosion in the system. Be sure the gaskets in the lid touch the surface of the fluid when you replace the lid. Now this is very important. Check the brake fluid again in a few days. If the level is down again, you should immediately have the brake system checked professionally. If your car has power steering, check your power steering fluid. There's a little dipstick in the cap on the pump, which is usually located near the front of the car. If it's low, top it off with power steering fluid. And while you're at it, check the windshield washer fluid. It's in another plastic bottle. Never use regular dish detergent, because the next time it rains, you'll end up with a windshield full of bubbles. Check the windshield wipers. They either slide or snap in and out. If they're frayed or dried out, Change them now so you can see clearly when you need them during the next rainstorm. Check your lights. Turn the lights on. Walk around the car. Are all the headlights and taillights functioning? Check the brights, the parking lights, the directional signals. Ask someone to help you check to see if the brake lights come on when you step on the brake pedal. If you can't, back up to a wall or a garage door and check the reflections in the rearview mirror. You'll also want to check your tires, and we've got a whole section on tires coming up. We'll show you how to read a tire gauge, how to check your treads for wear. But for now, make sure that every tire is well inflated, and don't forget the spare. Well, that's about it. If any of your fluid levels were low, check them again in about a week to make sure that they're not leaking. Use your good judgment, and when in doubt, go to a mechanic. If the thought of that terrifies you, we'll give you some tips on how to find a good one later on in the tape. Let's get the hoods back on these cars. Special effects? Where's the special effects? Come on, guys. Guys, these are rentals. Comes out of my pocket.
Here's a riddle for you. What happens when you're running late, your plane is leaving in 45 minutes, and you haven't picked up your dry cleaning yet? Your car won't start. So you've heard this one before. Yep. What would you do? Well, I could take a cab and buy new clothes, but I'd still have a dead car to come home to. You know, a lot of times you can figure out what's wrong and get the car fixed and get on the road with very little problem. What if you don't hear anything when you turn the key in the ignition? Well, turn the ignition key to off and check out the battery. Now, the easiest way to tell if the battery's working is to turn on your headlights. If they're on and they're bright, the battery's okay. If they're very dim or not working at all, the poor thing is dead. Look at the battery. If the two cables that are attached to the metal terminals are loose, tighten them. If that doesn't work, you should check your battery for water. If it isn't sealed, open the caps and check to see if the liquid inside covers the metal fins in each chamber. If they're low, add distilled water. If the cables are corroded, take a screwdriver with an insulated or wooden handle and jam it between the cable connector and the terminal. Then have someone else try to start your car. If that works, remove the screwdriver and you're on your way. But you'll probably have to replace the old cables. Now, what if your batteries died because you left your lights on? Not that that's ever happened to me. Oh, we've all done that. But it's the easiest problem to remedy. Yeah, all you need is an auto club card and a telephone. Well, if you have a friend with another car and a set of jumper cables, you won't have to wait to be rescued. Jumper cables are inexpensive and easy to use. You should keep a set in your trunk. Now, almost any other car will do as long as it has a battery with the same voltage as yours. Most batteries are 12 volts. But here's a warning, though. Some late model car should never be jump-started or used to jump another car. It can hurt their computer brains. So if you drive a late model car, check your owner's manual and look for warning signs near the battery. Before you do anything, it's very important that both cars are in park with the ignition switch off and the emergency brake on. Remove the caps from the tops of the batteries on both cars unless they're the sealed kind. This vents the dangerous gases from the battery. The rest is easy, if you do it in the right order. Each set of jumper cables has a pair of red clips and a pair of black ones. First, attach one of the red clips to the positive terminal of your battery. That's the terminal which has POS, or the plus sign on it, and it's usually larger than the other one. It's easy to attach the clips. They just squeeze open and pinch on. Attach the other red clip to the positive terminal of the live battery. Now, attach one of the black clips to the negative terminal of the live battery. And finally, the last black clip goes to a piece of the engine on your car that has no paint, isn't near the carburetor or the battery, and is an aluminum. This grounds the spark safely away from gases and fumes. After the clips are on, start the other car. And after it's running, try yours. It should start. Here's a thought. You should never do this when you're standing in the rain or in a puddle. Yeah, that's never a good idea. Once your car has started, you don't want to turn the engine off. So while it's running, disconnect the cables in the reverse order and go on your way. It's important to drive your car around for at least 15 minutes to recharge the battery before you shut it off again. If your alternator light stays on or your gauge continues to point to discharge or minus after your car has been running, it could be that the fan belt's not tight enough to run your alternator properly. If your battery keeps going dead, have it tested to see if you need a new one. If your car won't start on rainy days, it could be your distributor. That's the thing with the plastic cap and a lot of wires coming out of it, kind of like an octopus. Remove the cap with a screwdriver and check to see if there's moisture inside. If that's the problem, you can use some of this stuff to completely dry the cap. It's called mechanic solvent, and it sucks up moisture. Now clean the cap up with a lint-free rag and put it back on. It's possible that the cap has a small crack that's letting the moisture in. If so, you should buy a new one. You know, some cars just don't seem to like cold mornings. If your car doesn't start, try checking under the air cleaner. That's located on top of the carburetor you'll see a round hole with a little metal disc in it. That's the infamous choke. Its job is to stay closed until your car is warmed up. So if it's stuck open, your car won't start. Wiggle it with your finger. If it still sticks, try a shot of commercial spray lubricant. That should loosen it up.
If the car starts but keeps dying on you, the choke might be stuck closed and isn't opening when the car warms up. Follow the same procedure to make sure the choke is moving freely. If you have fuel injection or a diesel engine, your car doesn't have a carburetor or a choke. But if it doesn't like cold mornings, there are special heaters to help it start. If you live in a really frigid climate, you may want to have one installed. And finally, if your car cranks over and over but it won't start, you might be out of gas. Gas gauges sometimes lie. Maybe we should have mentioned that to begin with. You know, even worse than finding that your car won't start in the morning is being inside one when it decides to sputter and die on a busy highway. We've asked the California Highway Patrol to give us some pointers on how to get yourself and your car safely off the road in an emergency. Hi, I'm Sergeant Mark Lund, and I'd like to give you a few tips on what to do if your car fails on the highway. First of all, stay calm. Exit the highway if you can. If not, try to reach the right-hand shoulder of the road. Even if the engine fails completely, you should still have enough momentum to coast out of the traffic and onto the shoulder. Use your turn signal so traffic behind you can tell what you're going to do. If other drivers don't respond, use your emergency flashers. But remember, with your flashers on, traffic won't know which way you're heading. As you pull over, try to get well away from any curves behind you, because that makes you hard to see. If a car stops in the middle of a busy freeway and you can't coast out of the traffic lane, turn on your emergency flashers and stay inside the car to wait for help. It may be frightening to sit there with traffic zipping by and piling up behind you, but it can be suicide to attempt to cross a busy freeway on foot. Freeways are generally well patrolled, and other motorists who see you in trouble usually notify us right away. Chances are that you won't have to wait very long for help. If you can reach the right shoulder, keep your emergency flashers on or use the left turn signal to alert other traffic to the fact that your car is not moving. If it's nighttime, put out flares, a lantern, a large flashlight about six feet behind the car. This will make you more visible to traffic and give them a better chance to avoid you. On the highway, an open hood is a universal trouble sign. It will let passing motorists as well as patrol cars know that you have a problem. But before you get out of your car to open the hood, there are a few things to remember. Only get out of the car on the non-traffic side. Keep an eagle eye on the cars coming up behind you. It's a fact that drunk drivers hone in on flashing lights. So after you get out of the car, keep an eye on traffic and be sure to stand near the front of your car. Never stand between two cars. You might sustain serious leg injuries if the rear car gets hit. If you're alone and a stranger comes to offer help, use extreme caution, folks. It's a crazy world out there, and with a disabled vehicle, you are quite vulnerable, even with traffic flowing by. You don't need to insult the Good Samaritan. Ask the Good Samaritan to help by contacting the authority from the nearest phone. We're always standing by to help motorists in distress. So buckle up, don't drink and drive, and may your car never break down on the highway. Thanks, guys. Now, once you and your car are safe, 
open the hood and look for something obvious, like a missing engine or a broken fan belt or hose. These are easy to replace on the road if you've planned ahead and you carry spare hoses and belts in the trunk. Now, that's an especially good idea during a long road trip. In any case, once you've spotted the trouble, you'll be able to tell the towing service the model, make, and year of your car and try to convince them to bring you a replacement part. A quick roadside fix might save you a major towing charge. See, many times the problem is that your car is overheating. Overheating is usually caused by a lack of coolant or low engine oil or sometimes low transmission fluid or sometimes driving with too heavy a load. Now, if you're on the road and your car starts to overheat, try shutting off your air conditioner. This will decrease the load on the engine and help it to cool off. Keep your eye on the temperature gauge. If you continue to overheat and you can't pull over, turn on the car heater and blower till you can get off the road. Chances are you'll overheat on a hot day, so it won't be very comfortable. But often running the heater will transfer the heat from the engine to the interior of the car. If that seems to work, you obviously are going to want to open your car windows. Now, if you're stuck in traffic and the temperature gauge is rising, shift into neutral and rev the engine a little to make the water pump and the fan speed up. This will draw more liquid and air through the radiator. The increased air and liquid circulation should help to cool things off. If all this fails and you think your car is about to boil over, get to the side of the road safely and open the hood and sit there until things cool off. Now, we can't stress this enough. If your car is overheating, don't open the radiator cap. You could get a very bad burn. Don't add water until the car is very cool. If you must add water when the engine is still a little warm, this is very important. Add the water slowly while the engine is running in neutral gear. Or else all that cold water can crack your engine block, which is not a pretty sight. You know, oil is the lifeblood of your car. Sure, it needs gas and air, but oil reduces friction, and friction is what causes your car to die before it's time. Oil gets between the moving metal parts of the engine and provides a cushion which prevents friction. It also cools the engine and carries away up to 40% of the engine's heat. Not only that, it helps seal the rings and the cylinder wall for better power, compression, and efficiency. Now, if you watch your oil levels and you change your oil regularly, you will add years to the life of your car. I suggest changing the oil every 3,000 miles or two to three months, and the oil filter every other time. But this can vary. For instance, oil breaks down much faster if your car never gets a chance to warm up properly. It may seem backwards, but if you only use your car to go to the corner store, you may need to change your oil as often as every 1,000 miles. When you change the oil, have the car lubricated to prevent moving parts outside the engine from wearing each other away. Consult your owner's manual for the amount and the type of oil the manufacturer recommends. Most cars use between four and six quarts. Let's show you how to read a can of oil. These letters are called the API rating. That's the American Petroleum Institute. The markings indicate the classification of oil. Oils that begin with the letter S are for regular cars. SD, SE, and SF are detergent oils. Most cars made after 1980 use SF rated oil. Again, check your manual. The letter C stands for compression ignition. In other words, it's for diesel cars. These markings show the SAE rating of the oil. SAE stands for the Society of Automotive Engineers. These ratings tell you what temperature range the oil is good for. 30 weight is average. Lower numbers are for colder environments. Higher numbers for hotter places. An SAE rating like 1030 or 1040 means the oil will perform over a wide temperature range. You may want to save some money and change your own oil. It's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is consult Deanna's book, Auto Repair for Dummies, and follow the simple to understand instructions. It's true. I am a real advocate of doing it yourself. But before you get too far, check where the oil drain plug and the oil filter are. If they're in an unreachable or an awkward place, forget it. Save yourself the grief, leave it to a professional. 
You know, oil is so important to your car that even if you have it changed at a garage, an oil change franchise, a dealership, or a major service center, there are some things you should check after the service. On your way home, watch the oil pressure gauge or the indicator light on the dashboard. If the oil pressure seems low, don't drive the car. Something's wrong. Check the oil dipstick before you drive the car the next day to make sure the level isn't too low or too high. Double check that the oil filler cap was put back on right. Look to see that the oil isn't leaking out of the drain plug under the engine. It might need tightening, or there's a sealing gasket that should have been replaced when the oil change was done. Take a look at the oil filter to make sure it isn't leaking. If the filter looks very different from what you remember seeing during your 15-minute checkup, take your car back to the shop and have them make sure that they use the right filter. Well, that's it. So... Whether you go to an auto service center or you do it yourself, the important thing is to keep up your oil maintenance. It's the single most important point of car care. You know, I've always felt you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their shoes. Well, the same is true for your car. You can tell a lot about it by reading the wear patterns on your tires. If your tires are worn down the sides and still look like new in the center, it probably means that they're underinflated. This can cost you many miles per gallon, and it makes steering difficult. They also wear out much faster. Now, if the tires are worn down in the center and still look good on the outside, they're probably overinflated. This can cause blowouts, or it can bounce you right off the road. Some people think overinflation saves gas, but actually, new tires cost more than the gas you'd save. If the tire is worn down one side only, the wheels may have been jolted out of alignment. Have the front end aligned fast. If the car is trying to go one way and the wheels another, you could wear out a new set of good tires in as little as a day. Now, if you see wear bars across the tread, that means the tread has been used up. The tires have to be replaced. The police can also see the wear bars and they'll give you a ticket. But much worse, you could be injured if the tires lose their grip or they blow out on the road. Now, a simple way to check tread wear is to place a Lincoln penny head down between the treads. You can see the top of Lincoln's head. The treads are worn below the legal limits. For accurate readings, buy your own tire gauge. They only cost a couple of dollars. Surveys have shown that the gauges attached to the hoses at the gas station are not very accurate. You'll know how much air your tire should have by looking for the words maximum PSI, written right here on the tire. This shows how many pounds per square inch the tire should hold. Stay within two pounds of max and you'll be fine. Also, for accurate readings, remember to check your tires when they're cold. Unscrew the cap on the valve stem and press the end of the gauge against the valve. Read the stick that emerges from the other end of the gauge. If they're low, use the air hose at your filling station to fill them up. If you put too much air in, Use the little bump on the back of the gauge to let some air out. Now, you might want to practice this at a gas station because if you're like me, you'll lose a little air as you learn to use the gauge. It's a good idea to rotate your tires every 6,000 miles. It keeps the wear more even and adds a lot of useful miles to your tires. Tires need to be aligned and balanced when they're rotated. These are things that you really can't do yourself but it's up to you to keep a record and get the work done. Take a look at these shoes, huh? You know, they say I'll get another 40,000 miles out of these, provided I keep them rotated regularly.
Look, let's face it. We all get flats. Yet, for some reason, we always tend to take it personally. If you watch the condition of the tires, you can usually avoid trouble. But no matter how careful you are, you can still pick up a piece of glass or a nail on the road. Now, although changing tires probably builds character, your most important tool is a current auto club card. Because if you belong to an auto club, they'll come out and they'll change the tire for you. For me, knowing you can call an emergency road service is a real comfort. But even if you are a member of an auto club, you might still get a flat in the middle of nowhere. If there's no phone around, you're going to have to take care of the situation yourself. Now, here's a great tip. You can possibly avoid changing a tire on the road by carrying a can of inflatable air sealant. It's available in most auto supply stores. Now, the can contains a mixture of compressed gas and sealing gook. It'll inflate the tire and seal the puncture so you can get to a service station. Before you use it, be sure that you don't have a rip or tear in the side of the tire. The sealant might squirt out at you. But if it's a tread puncture from glass or a nail, this stuff will get you back on the road in a hurry. Now, since the sealant will coat the inside of the tire, the gook should be removed when you have it repaired. Now, if you do have to change your tire yourself because it's damaged beyond sealing, then consult your owner's manual for how to go about it. But here's another great tip. Most tires are put on cars by mechanics or factories that use air-powered wrenches called gorillas. That's great until a normal human being tries to get the lug nuts loose in an emergency. Get yourself a cross-shaft lug wrench and a piece of pipe for leverage. Loosen the lug nuts and re-tighten them by hand before you get a flat. Do it now. Tighten the lug nuts in pairs of opposites and be sure you don't forget any. Give the wrench an extra little kick with your hand. Make sure the nuts are on tight. If a human tightened them, a human should be able to loosen them again. Now this is important. Be sure to have any flat tire fixed immediately so you'll have an inflated spare tire the next time you need one. You know, cars can't talk to us when they're sick, so instead they have a little habit of leaving deposits up and down the driveway. When this happens, you know something's wrong. It's up to you to diagnose what's going on with your car by using your ears, your eyes, even your nose. For instance, if you hear singing under the hood, it's probably your fan belt telling you that it's either out of adjustment or needs to be replaced. If the car is idling with an offbeat rhythm, one or more of the spark plugs might be misfiring. Either the plug or the cable that connects the plug to the distributor is not in good condition. Or maybe a cable came loose. Now, if the idle is rough but even, then the carburetor probably needs to be adjusted. If you hear a loud knocking sound under the hood, pull over and park as soon as you can. Hopefully, it's just a broken fan belt. But if the knocking is coming from inside the engine, don't drive any further and call for road service. This can be a symptom of serious trouble that might destroy the engine. Now, if your brakes are squeaking, then the brake linings may be glazed or very worn, and they should be replaced. Never take chances with your brakes. If you have any doubts at all, have them checked professionally. Also, check your owner's manual to see if you have disc brakes. This type of brake tends to squeal more, even if there's nothing wrong with them. To be on the safe side, get them checked anyway, just in case. Now, if your car sounds like a 10-ton truck or a giant Harley-Davidson motorcycle, 
probably has a hole in the muffler. Get a new one immediately. Not only is it illegal to drive with a noisy muffler, it's also dangerous. Carbon monoxide can get inside the car. If your horn gets stuck, you've got a racket and a lot of unhappy neighbors on your hands. For a quick fix, locate the car's fuse box and pull the car horn fuse. As a matter of fact, it's a good idea to know where your fuse box is and which fuses are for what. Get the horn fixed right away. It's dangerous and illegal to drive without one. Now here's a good way to find leaks. We parked a very sick car on this sheet of white paper and we left it overnight. By marking the location of the wheels before we move the car, we can tell what these leaks are and maybe where they're coming from. You can do the same thing in your driveway or garage. If the liquid is black and greasy and it's from under the engine area, you've lost some oil. Check to see if it's coming from the side of the engine or from the drain plug under the engine. If it's pink and oily and dripped from under the passenger compartment, it's transmission fluid. If the leak is from under the radiator or the engine area, it's probably coolant. Now, a dry stain or a streak right next to where a wheel was standing is brake fluid from a leaky wheel cylinder. Unless, of course, it's a stain on the outside of the wheel, in which case it's a stray dog. If it's brown and smells like gasoline and is anywhere from the front to the rear of the car, it is gasoline. This is dangerous. Get to a mechanic. Better yet, don't drive. Get the mechanic to come to you. Leaks won't heal themselves. So have them fixed to avoid more damage to your car. By doing this leak test yourself, you may save the mechanic hours of investigation, which can save you hours of labor charges. You might even get a little respect. A sharp nose can also warn you of potential problems. If you smell rubber burning under the hood, a hose might be touching a hot part of the engine. Rescue it before it melts through. If you smell burning rubber, and it's not coming from under the hood, feel your wheels. If one is hot, a brake shoe may be dragging, or you may be driving with your parking brake on. If you smell exhaust fumes in the passenger compartment, open the windows immediately. A faulty exhaust pipe may be allowing carbon monoxide to seep in through the floor. With the windows closed, this can kill you. Get it handled right away. Now, if you smell gasoline, it's important to find the leak and stop it immediately. Gasoline is highly flammable, and the fumes are explosive. Oh, yeah. Don't smoke. And remember, if you get to know your car, it'll be easy to notice if something is different or wrong. Right. If you hear something funny, chances are you won't fix it by turning up the radio. Now, I know that under normal conditions, most cars need to be tuned up every 10,000 miles or six months, whichever comes first. Right. And even more often if you tow something and before and after long trips. But, Deanna, doesn't the word tune-up mean different things at different garages? Yes. You can shop for tune-up specials in your local newspaper. If you do, be sure to compare the quoted price, the work the offer includes, and whether or not the stated price includes all the parts or just the labor. It's also a good idea to do your 15-minute checkup before you go for a tune-up. That way you'll know what other work you might want done. Tune-ups usually don't include a lube or an oil change, so if you need one, remember to ask for it. Now, the next big question is, how do you choose the right mechanic? Choose a mechanic the same way you would a doctor or a lawyer, by recommendation. If a shop has given good service to your friends and neighbors, it'll probably make you happy, too. Remember, price is not the only criterion. If you've just moved or you're considering changing mechanics, check the local Better Business Bureau to see if there have been any complaints about them. The ASE patch on a mechanic's uniform certifies that he or she has passed tests in a variety of automobile repair areas. A AAA shield outside a shop indicates that it's an auto club approved repair facility, which means they meet some very high standards. 
Large chain stores with automotive departments often advertise car repair or maintenance specials. They can save you money. They usually offer good guarantees on parts and labor and honor them at all of their locations. If you choose an independent mechanic, you might also want to buy a copy of your car's service manual. You can get it from the dealership or write to the manufacturer. It'll give you more information about the car than the owner's manual. I always leave mine when I take my car in for service. I know they can't stock the manuals for all makes and models of cars. Providing them with the manual means they can do better and faster work for me. Right. Maybe your mechanic has a good book that you'd like to borrow. I've washed a lot of cars in my life, but only recently did I learn there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. It's better for your car if you wash it yourself. Some drive-through car washes can be hard on a car's finish. They cause wear and tear, especially on convertible tops. But it's still better than leaving the car dirty. Remember, dirt eats paint. First, park your car in a shady spot. You should never wash your car in the hot sun. This won't help your suntan, but it will save your car's finish. Before you wash the car, hose it down completely to get rid of the dust. Never wipe a dry car with a rag or you'll scratch it. It's better to use a specially formulated car washing product that has a bit of wax in it, like this one. Wash the car from the top down. Don't forget behind the wheels, inside the fenders, behind the bumpers. While you're in there, check for rust. It's a car killer. Today, there are products on the market that penetrate rust and convert it into a harmless substance. Wash the car one section at a time. Hose it down, soap it up, rinse it off. When you're finished, rinse off the entire car carefully. Towel dry the car with terry towels or a chamois. Don't scratch it hard to remove dirt. Soak it loose by placing a wet rag on it. If your car has road tar or disgusting dead bugs all over it, there are specialty products that will remove them without damaging your finish. Wax protects your car's finish from the sun, and it retards rust. It'll also make dirt easier to remove. Put the wax on following the contours of the car, not in circles. Do it one section at a time. Buff with a soft, clean, dry rag or a chamois. Now you can clean the windows and the side mirrors with a home window cleaner. Polish the chrome with a chrome cleaner. Clean the white walls and tires with mild soap or dish detergent. You can use a kitchen scouring pad to get rid of spots. For custom wheels, use a specialty product. Renew and protect vinyl hardtops and interiors with a good cleaner and preservative. So did you know there's an unconfirmed rumor that clean cars run better, use less gas, and break down less often? I've always believed that's true. Well, if it is, does that mean that we're smarter right after we take a bath? Well, maybe now you'll feel a little less like a dummy about your car. See, owning a car means freedom. Freedom to go where you want, when you want, but it also means taking responsibility for your car. Yeah. 
Get involved with your car. It's your faithful steed. You don't have to be a do-it-yourself mechanic. But like a cowboy, you ought to know how to feed and groom your horse. Well, before we go trotting off into the sunset, is there anything else we should tell them? Yeah. The big question is, what are you going to do next? Don't just put this tape on the shelf until something goes wrong. Sure. Rewind the tape to the beginning, right now. Look at the section on the 15-minute checkup again. Then, go outside, open the hood on your car, take a look. Try to identify some of the parts that we've been talking about. Go ahead and touch stuff. Check your oil, look at your air filter, the hoses, the belts. In fact, do the whole 15-minute checkup. Once you get the hang of it, it'll probably take less than 10 minutes a month. And you'll be amazed at how confident you'll feel about your car once you've looked at it and touched it. It's a real thrill to be able to tell a mechanic what you think may be wrong with your automobile. If you start today, it won't be long before you realize you don't feel like a dummy about your car anymore. And for those of you who want to get a little further into it and save money on basic repairs, don't forget Deanna's wonderful book, Auto Repair for Dummies. It's full of easy-to-follow information that'll help you to do the work yourself. May you and your car have a long and happy life together. And drive carefully. Remember, the life you save may be mine. <laughs>